Born in Denmark, Peter David Peterson has lived in Japan for over 25 years. Starting his work for a business consulting firm in Tokyo in 1995, Peter became a specialist in the futures field engaging in speaking, writing, and consulting activities. In 1999, he launched his publishing company Planet Publishing, and was also appointed as a newscaster on Tokyo Metropolitan Television in 2000. He introduced the concept of LOHAS, Lifestyles, of Health and Sustainability to Japan in 2002 and more recently co-founded NELIS, Next Leaders Initiative for Sustainability. He is the co-founder of eSquare Incorporated, one of Japan's leading sustainability think tanks and consultancies. He has worked with about 100 Japanese corporations on integrating sustainability into corporate strategy. He is also involved in corporate leadership development as the executive director of Tackle the Academy for Corporate Leadership. Uh, now you gave me the very cruel, cruel task of talking just before dinner. So you're all only interested in the very near future, I guess, um, what you're going to have for dinner. So I'll try to be uh, short, crisp, and sharp. Um, I'm going to talk about the resilient corporation and how to sort of future-proof your organization, which is, of course, impossible to do in its entirety, but you can do better than others, and that's what we want to try to do. I would like to say we've been talking about the future, and I think the starting point is going back to what the CEO, whose name I could not remember in one session, I'm afraid, <laughs> uh, he said, we must dream. Unless we dream about what future we want to create and are not just carried away by technological trends, we will never have a desirable future. So I really think we should start there. But apart from that, how can we future-proof our organization, try to create a resilient organization that, is, that rides on the change, that enjoys the change, that really not only manages the uncertainty, but actually extracts new opportunities out of uncertainty. That is what I call the resilient organization. First of all, uh, we live, as we have maybe also slightly heard today, in a VUCA age. I'm sure most of you know the VUCA acronym, which stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. These are some of the main characteristics of the age we live in today, and we've heard some data today about why it is so. But the funny thing is, we always live on the edge of the future. Whatever time we're in, we live on the edge of the future. So maybe there is nothing new in that, actually that we live in a VUCA age. Here are two gentlemen with whom I was very lucky to work in the 90s. Uh, we have Alvin Toffler, the futurist, who died recently, and Peter Drucker, the father of modern management studies, you could say, two wonderful gentlemen. And they wrote books about the same time, around 1970. Alvin Toffler, Future Shock, 1970. The future is moving so fast now that your organization cannot possibly adapt unless you read my book. Basically, I guess that was a message. Uh, very similar theme for Peter Drucker, 1969, the age of discontinuity. We had the age of continuity from around 1913 to 1969, he said, and now we have the age of discontinuity. Global markets, new ways of working, a knowledge economy. You must really innovate, adapt to stay ahead of the curve. So. Look, 47, 46 years ago, some of the same things were said. Certainly, speed has gone up, but we're always living on the edge of the future. And there's only one thing that we, we can really, for sure, predict about the future, or say about the future. That is, <clears throat> that we cannot predict it. We cannot even tell what happens tomorrow. One of your largest competitors might go bankrupt. Uh, something completely unpredictable might ha happen on financial markets. There could be a coup in one of your key markets. Who knows? So, because we cannot predict the future, let's look at how we can build resilient, future-proof organizations as far as possible. And this is a very human task. It is about the teamwork. It is about how you organize the organization. It is about how, about how you unleash innovation across the organization. How can you not be scared of the future, 
but say, well, we know we are probably better prepared than anybody else every, out there. So let's not worry about the future. Let's enjoy it. To do that, I'm basically going to be talking about glasses, like Mr. Kawaguchi. Uh, but the glasses that I'm going to be talking about are glasses with three lenses. I'll show you an example in a few moments. Uh, based on my experience, 20 years working with Japanese and other corporations, I sort of tried to distill the three most important aspects of a resilient organization. What makes an organization both able to adapt, able to have strong teamwork, able to align with the future, able to create something of value both for the company and for society. And my conclusion was that you need the triple A of organizational performance, you could say. This is not the triple A of financial performance. This is the triple A of organizational performance. And I say, as you can see on this slide, that just by looking at what is above the surface top of the iceberg, which is sales, profits, products, services, you cannot tell whether the company is resilient. Think of Enron, 2002. They looked like a high-flying company. Four days because before they sort of exploded in midair, they had a triple A financial rating from Moody's and Standard & Poor's and so on. Then bang, they exploded. The reason was below the surface. So let's look below the surface. What are the triple A's of organizational performance? I'm sure you could choose many others. I, through my work, have identified three. The first is anchoring, second is adaptiveness, and the third is alignment with the age in which we live, with society, and with key stakeholders. I will get into more detail about what I mean with these three A's. So here are the glasses that were not in Mr. Kawaguchi's high-tech presentation. These are the most innovative glasses you have ever seen. They're very, they're very difficult to put on, actually. Uh, but you need, as a manager of a company, to look at your organization through these three lenses, the three A's. Actually, there are also questions to you in those, hidden in those three A's. Anchoring, of course, is there are three questions. Are, you, are your values and mission really alive? I guess that's a theme for you tomorrow. Do you have a really compelling mission that grabs the hearts of people working in the company and also appeals to customers? Is there, among key stakeholders, trust beyond contract, not what, what is just written in the contract? Those are three key elements of anchoring. How anchored is your corporation? Second, of course, this is not enough to be future-proof. You need what has been maybe the key theme today, a high degree of adaptiveness. Do you have a dynamic and open learning environment? Are you unleashing innovation across the organization, not just in limited sections? And thirdly, are you really shaking up R&D functions? But I'm arguing that even with these two A's, you cannot be an excellent corporation, a resilient corporation in the 21st century. You need the third A, which is alignment. Alignment with society and key stakeholders. Here the questions are, are you systematically really reading mega trends? Are you setting a strategy that is not a trade-off strategy with society? but what I call a trade-on strategy, which is basically the opposite of trade-off. And thirdly, are you building social excellence into your brand identity? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves, and these are the questions we need to answer to be resilient corp corporations. Let me uh, give a few concrete examples. GM versus Toyota. <clears throat> you know that GM used to be synonymous with an automotive corporation. What is good for GM is good for America, it was said in the 1940s. But poor GM, they basically went bankrupt in 2009. Only taxpayer money could save the company. I'm not sure they're saved yet, looking at the company. Versus Toyota, sure, Toyota's went into its fair share of trouble, but they always somehow managed to muddle through. They always somehow managed to get out stronger. Clearly, there's a resilience difference between the two companies. Let's take another example. We already heard about Kodak several times today. Did you know that this company used to have 90% market share of the analog film market in the 1970s in the US? They had not even heard about a company called Fujifilm. Fujifilm, pretty difficult to pronounce, right? But after the Lehman shock, the financial crisis, 
that gave the last blow to Kodak and the company basically went bankrupt in 2012. They're trying to restructure. Fujifilm, on the other hand, adapted. Digital cameras. Well, now the digital camera gone. Now we go into medicine. We go into cosmetics. They were a highly resilient organization. <coughs> and the third example, Sony versus Apple. Sony was the only company, apart from American companies, that appeared in Visionary Company, book by Jim Collins in 1994. But shortly after that, for some reason, Sony lost its ways. It became sort of a roller coaster, a Dutch roll, we call it. Uh, lost its direction, and for more than 10 years in Japan, at least, it was called uh, one of the sort of losing companies that really couldn't find their way. In the same time, Apple took over the sort of almost cult-like status that Sony used to have. Apple became the company to love instead of Sony. What happened? Something happened with these companies. One side stayed resilient, really led the market, even in hard times. The other side lost resilience. And my idea is that we can AAA analyze these companies. We can identify where the weak links were in the three A's. And that will take too much time to do in detail today, <clears throat> but you can do that with any company of a certain size on this globe, basically. And you can certainly do it with your own company. But it takes a certain degree of honesty and really put on those glasses and have the courage to look at your organization through them. So, <clears throat> what to do about it? Can you really future-proof your company? And of course, my idea is that you can at least be better at it than others, and that's all that matters. We can never be perfect, but competitiveness is, is about being better at it than others, being able to enjoy the future instead of fearing it. So, I said management is looking at your company through the three A lenses, but management is also discovering and strengthening any possible issues or weakened A's. Because I guarantee you, in Fusol, in any other company, Daimler, Toyota, GM, whatever, if you have a weakening in one of these A's, a serious weakening, anchoring, adaptiveness, alignment, that will be the weak link in your company. That will reduce your future resilience. That will make the future a scary place instead of a fun place where you enjoy the ride. So, to conclude with, uh, I will <clears throat> present two examples of companies that successfully re-strengthened one weakened A. I'll start with Danone, uh, the one of the world's largest dairy and water companies. I'm sure you know Danone. Actually, it, it, most people think it's a French company, which it is. It was born, though, in Barcelona in 1919. Danone in the 1990s wanted to be Nestle. They wanted to be a general food company that could do everything. The result, they ended up with 300 different products, 12 different product lines, completely unclear brand image, very low morale inside the company. They were becoming completely unanchored. Then they had a shift of management in 1996, and the new CEO decided that they needed to re-anchor, or they called it in Danone, re-centering. They needed to reset their mission. They needed to focus their business divisions around the mission. And they would do only business that related to that new mission. And what he actually did in 10 years, he sold off about 60% of the assets of the company. Business divisions that did not fit with the mission were sold off. Sauce business was sold to Ajinomoto in Japan. Glass business was sold to another company. They focused on markets where they could win and where they had alignment with their mission. It took about 10 years, and for many years, sales stayed flat. But then after 2007, they really started, sales figures started improving. And I know one vice president in Danone who was involved in this process, and she says now she could not imagine doing business that is not related to the mission. And the mission, the new mission is bring health through food to as many people as possible <coughs> on Earth. All discussions in the company center around this new mission. Everyone is excited. We're not just trying to sell products. We're not just trying to make a profit. We are trying to take this mission to the world. And actually, that mission reaches back to the founding roots, 1919 in Barcelona, when Danone was created to produce yogurt for people, for children after the First World War, who were undernourished. So they sort of retranslated that old 
transmission of yogurt for children into a new version, bring health through food to as many people as possible. And they very successfully re-anchored, and that made them a much stronger company. The final example <clears throat> is a realigning with society and stakeholder expectations, the last A. Nike, one of the world's most successful companies right now, had a very rough ride in the 1990s. You may know about it. They had problem with their contract factories in Southeast Asia. People were working at or below minimum wages under harsh working conditions. They were attacked, boycotted, and in 1998, profit dropped by 50%. Phil Knight, the founder, said, wow, something is going on here. We have to listen to what's going on. We have to shift from being what in Japanese is called a black company. A black company is a company that really w uses workers very hard without consideration for humane conditions and so on. So they embarked on a journey, first monitoring factories, collaborating with NGOs instead of just sort of closing the doors. Then the next step was materials innovation. We want to be a sustainability leader in sustainable materials. Again, it was a journey. They could not realign in a year or two. It took maybe up to 10 years. But really now, Nike is seen as a world leader. They are often called a sustainable brand, a social brand leader. They are a leader in the materials revolution in the apparel sector as well. And they were the first apparel company to be include, included in Dow Jones Industrial Index in 2013 or 14. So another journey showing that you can, if you lost or weakened a the alignment A, you can strengthen it, and thus strengthen your corporate resilience. So, what is it worth creating a resilient organization? Well, talking about the future, I've mentioned it twice already. Do you fear the future or do you enjoy it? Will you just manage uncertainty or will you extract new opportunities out of uncertainty before competitors do so? That is one thing. So, of course, if you're a resilient organization, you will be better able to make profits in the future. But that's not all. What I've learned studying lots of corporations around the world, writing a book about this theme is that it's, such companies are also much nicer to work for. If you have a high degree of adaptiveness, if you're highly anchored, if you feel you're aligned with society, much, much nicer company to work for. So much higher employee motivation. Well, that leads to innovation. Innovation leads to new products, uh, on the edge business initiatives. And of course, a resilient corporation that really lives those three A's is much more welcomed by society and by key stakeholders. So I think there are very great benefits from looking at your organization through these glasses with three lenses. Thank you.